started um, and if folks come in uh, we'll catch them up uh, still okay sound wise a little louder how's that better projecting um, cool so that's good uh, and I did turn off flux excellent cool all right so first yes flux is off second uh, thanks so much for coming I, I really appreciate you all taking the time to come and see me talk um, Thank you to RailsConf for agreeing to let me talk. Thanks so much to Kansas City for hosting all of us. So, yeah. Yeah, some applause for Kansas City. All right. Excellent. Um, cool. So, uh, hello. Um, hi. Uh, I figure this is a computer talk, so we have, to, we have to start with zero, right? So, part zero. Um, thanks. Uh, I tend to speak really quickly. So if I start going way too fast, I, get, I talk fast when I'm excited. I get excited talking about Ruby and about hiring and about boot camps and about all this stuff. So if I start to go way too fast, just something, just like wave your arms or maybe dial it back, some kind of large gesture that I'm, I'm likely to see to sort of slow me down and, and, and help, help you guys follow along. Uh, I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes, maybe a tiny bit more. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, I'm gonna try not to just plow through this talk. Uh, it's funny, a little bit ago, I did a talk uh, on Ruby garbage collection. Uh, and I felt good about the talk, and I practiced it, and I was in a, in a good spot. Uh, and then right before I started, Mats came in and sat down front row center. <laughs> so I got to teach Mats about Ruby garbage collection. Uh, also like half the Ruby core team. So I did this talk pretending that all of you would be Mats, uh, or practiced it rather, and it seems that None of you is, so I, I, I hope I'm in a good spot, and that I, like I said, that I will just kind of truck through this talk. Uh, also, I'd, I'd ask you just to like stretch one arm. You can go ahead and just raise one arm. There's gonna be a little bit of interaction. Not a lot, I know we hate that. So I'm gonna ask you to other arm too, just in case you decide to switch it up. Um, I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hands at some point in the presentation, the show. Um, and, and that's gonna be the extent of the, you know, of the audience participation. So like I said, hello, uh, my name is Eric Weinstein. Uh, I work at Hulu as a senior engineering lead. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, in this human hash that I made. Um, if you like Ruby, and uh, I, I imagine you do, uh, or you wouldn't be here, uh, there's a book I wrote a little bit ago called Ruby Wizardry that teaches Ruby to uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds. Uh, that's available from No Starch, so thank you also to No Starch. Um, they've gone ahead and given us a 30% off coupon uh, promo code. So if you, anytime this week, go to nostarch.com. If you do wanna pick up a copy of Ruby Wizardry, physical or e, uh, just use RailsConf 2016, uh, and that will be 30% off. So again, thanks to, to No Starch for that. So like I said, this talk is pretty quick but uh, I think it's still beneficial for us to sort of know where we're going. Um, so this is a kind of quick overview of what we'll be talking about. Uh, we have the <laughs> obligatory clickbait, right? So where are we going? You know, that one big mistake we keep making, that one weird old tip, et cetera. Um, there'll be kind of a survey of the field. We'll talk a little bit about different bootcamp programs and, and sort of what they offer and, and what one learns in, in a bootcamp. Really what we should be looking for when interviewing bootcamp graduates. Um, this fourth one is, is super important, uh, and I believe it's kind of like gonna be the running theme of this talk, uh, and it's belief in improvement. If you don't believe that you can get better at math or programming or interviewing or X skill through deliberate practice and, and, and dedication, um, you're not going to. So I think that believing in improvement and then promulgating that as part of our culture, that we believe in improvement is, is huge. Uh, and finally, we'll, we'll touch on kind of a holistic model for continued growth, right? We, we will talk about interviewing, uh, and then once we've got folks in the door, how we help them continue to learn and to grow as part, of, uh, as part of the organization. So part one, we've cleared part zero. We're on the second part now. Uh, part one, hiring, right? Uh, I think the, the crucial thing is we sort of lost the thread a little bit ago um, 
in terms of interviewing, where we have confused the products for the process. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. But essentially, what we're looking for, right, is when we want to hire someone, we want to say, hey, abstractly, whatever it is that you know how to do, are you good at that thing, right? Whatever it is we're hiring for, whatever it is we need, um, are you good at doing that thing? And to some extent, we've confused that with concretions, with ideas of what we think people should know, um, and not generally stepping back and figuring out um, whether our, our needs are being met. Instead, kind of like looking at this particular example, and we'll talk more about it. Um, and, and it's kind of steeped in, in interviewing tradition, so we'll talk a bit about that as well. Uh, so we're on to the first arm exercise, right? Uh, I warned you about this. Uh, how many of you have attended a boot camp, or something that could be described as a boot camp, or a retreat, or something like that? Cool. Or worked with someone. Keep your hands up if you've worked with someone, or have hired someone, um, or have had some kind of meaningful interaction uh, with a boot camp. Okay, so a lot of you. Um, excellent. That's good. So this talk is kind of a lie. Um, it's, it's not entirely about boot camps. It is, in fact, kind of a, a larger talk about hiring generally and, and the sort of confusion in terms of hiring and growing generally. And it's sort of through the lens of boot camp uh, programs. A, because they're very popular. It's sort of a trending topic in the community now. B, it just provides us focus to talk about a particular non-traditional route as opposed to kind of the abstract non-traditional background entirely. Um, and. Uh, well, see, I guess it's not even really a lie. It's, it's more of a fib. It's about hiring and growing everyone, not just, not just graduates of uh, boot camp programs. Um, am I good on pace? Does this sound like a good, relaxing, excellent? Cool. Like I said, I'm going to try to dial this back just a tiny bit. So what is the traditional experience, right? Um, I think it's computing science, uh, which is not a typo. Uh, it turns out Dijkstra called it computing science. And I sort of like that, um, because when we call the tradition computer science, uh, it's sort of like we understand computers, right? And everybody knows that computers are actually tiny, non-deterministic boxes of feelings that do what they want. And no one actually really knows how they work. Um, it's a deep mystery of the universe. So we, we, I think, should call it computing science, because really, when someone majors in CS, they, they look at compiler design, they look at computation, they look at algorithms, data structures. There's some writing code sometimes. That's a thing that you sometimes do. Um, but that's really what we're talking about when we talk about a traditional background, a four-year degree in computing science, learning things like graphs and trees, uh, whiteboarding, a lot of whiteboarding, um, and then a language like Java or C++, right? Um, a language that you would be taught in school, a language that is the sort of lingua franca if you're looking at preparatory stuff like cracking the coding interview, um, things of that nature. And so this is that clickbaity thing I talked about, this one big mistake that we've made. And like I said, somewhere along the way, we've sort of confused this abstraction. You know, are you good at this thing that you know how to do? Are you good at this thing that we need? With this concretion of, given that the thing you do is computing science, are you good at it? And we sort of punish people who aren't. Um, or we, we kind of snipe, look for weaknesses in, in people who are not good at computing science or have not studied computing science. And fundamentals are important. Um, that's why they're fundamental. Um, but there's something that we should really pay attention to when we're interviewing, which is, are we looking for someone who is really good at computing science, or are we looking for something else? Um, because if we're looking for something else and we're hiring someone with that skill set, but we're interviewing for someone who, and this is another theme in this room if you've been in here earlier today, uh, is super good at red black trees, right? Um, that is a different thing than most of what we do day to day, programming Ruby, programming Rails. And all we're going to do if we ask someone these kinds of questions who comes from a boot camp or a non-traditional background is just make them feel bad that they don't know how to write a black, uh, red black tree from memory. So these are, this is the survey of the field that I promised you. It's just the ones that I'm most familiar with. Um, there's nearly 100 in North America alone, so I've just, picked, I've just picked these six. These are ones that I know have Ruby and Rails in their curricula. So we've got App Academy, Dev Boot Camp, the Flatiron School, General Assembly, Hack Reactor, and Turing School. So we're going to talk a little bit about these programs generally and get a sense of what the curricula are, what's taught, and, and guide our interview process from there. Sort of an NB, I attended um, Hacker School three years ago, which is now called the Recurse Center. I don't know if it's really a boot camp in the traditional sense, insofar as <laughs> traditional sense. 
uh, insofar as, you know, there's no curriculum. You can be doing Python for three months. You can be doing, you know, C++ for 20 years and be taking your open source vacation. You have all these 30 odd people, with these hugely disparate backgrounds in a room programming together for three months. It is a non-traditional route though, so I thought I'd mention it because we're about non-tradition uh, in this talk. So what do we learn in boot camps? <laughs> it's not computing science, not generally. We uh, learn things like Ruby and Rails, right? The curricula do vary from camp to camp, but we can talk, I think, in, in meaningful generalities. So there's server-side stuff like Ruby and Rails. There's client work in JavaScript, of course, because we are cursed <laughs> with JavaScript. Um, it sort of depends on what, uh, on what framework. So some will teach Angular, some will teach React. But there's some JavaScript, there's some client-side component. This is a full stack type of, of experience. So that also means that we learn software development tools and best practices. So deploying stuff on platforms as services like Heroku, using version control stuff like Git, uh, making sure that we can deploy something end to end and sort of work as working programmers. And these programs do teach to the test, quote unquote, they have to, right? You can't properly uh, train someone for interviewing and say, hey, you're, you're really good at this particular technology stack, you understand how to do all kinds of crazy Git bisecting things and reserving, uh, resolving merge conflicts. And you can work in a professional environment, but you are gonna have some trouble doing graph traversals on a whiteboard, and that's how you're going to be evaluated. So there is some of that. Though, I would argue, really what the meat of these projects and, and boot camps is, is learning how to function as working software engineers. So like I said, resolving Git conflicts, merge conflicts, working and deploying and, tra and tracking down weird bugs, things of that nature. A friend of mine kind of thinks of it as physicists versus carpenters. Um, this notion that like the physicist will tell you, yeah, what you've designed, that, that building won't fall down. That seems reasonable. Um, but there's all kinds of hands-on stuff, right? All kinds of physical acts of building software that you don't learn uh, as an undergraduate studying computing science. Uh, and I think it really boils down to sort of knowing that and knowing how. And I think we need both in order to have a meaningful education in, in programming and software engineering. So these are some of the things, given this, this one big mistake that we make, this confusion of are you good at this thing and are you good at computing science, these are the things that I look for when I'm interviewing anyone, but particularly boot camp graduates or, or folks with uh, non-traditional backgrounds. So the ability to write a non-trivial program, and by non-trivial I mean something that does something in the world, where you have network access or file I.O. or API calls, you know, it's not just fizzbuzz, it's not just balancing a tree. Uh, oftentimes I like to use problems that sort of are boiled down from or reduced from real problems that we have at Hulu. So I work on the ad platform team. My team, their job is to write the software that the sales planners and the ad traffickers use to determine what ads are, how, how ad campaigns are rolled out, whether you see the same ad four times in a row, I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> if you have seen four Geico ads in a row, I'm sorry. Uh, please come see me after the show and we'll, we'll fix it. Um, but, you know, having some kind of, you know, pair coding challenge where it's like, hey, we have one Geico ad and N other ads and how do we get a sequence of ads where we don't, you know, repeat ourselves however many times. Or we don't have two ads adjacent. Things like that. The ability to adapt to new and changing requirements. This is huge. Uh, this is probably the hardest thing to handle in an interview when someone says, great, that's a good solution, those tests passed, that looks nice. What about this? There's a new edge case, or there's a bug, or the client loves it and three weeks later there's a new request that completely turns on its head all the stuff that you just did. Dealing with that changing nature, dealing with kind of ambiguity. Rarely do we get full specifications, complete requirements. Very rarely does someone come to us and tell them exactly uh, tell us exactly what they want. The ability to work well with others, and this is why I want to do pairing and sort of collaborative interviews rather than adversarial ones. I think we should be working with interviewees and not literally challenging them to, to do better than someone else has done on this problem or do better than you yourself have done. You know, passing along the pain because you had to do this when you were interviewing. That was terrible and so everyone should feel terrible. Um, we should stop doing that. Uh, so the ability to work well with others is huge. To collaborate with someone over you know, remotely or in person and solve a problem. I look for people who are passionate about learning. People who deeply want to be better or to know more or to know why. 
And it doesn't have to be computing science. It can be people who are passionate about learning the guitar or learning philosophy or learning music. But I, I need people, thanks. I need people who are excited to learn and to become better because those are the people who are not gonna be satisfied when 10 clients are fine and one says, oh, I have this weird bug sometimes, but I guess it's fine because I don't see it a lot. Or it only happens on one machine or it only happens sometimes or someone has devised a bizarro workaround for some tool that you built and rather than actually fix it, you're like, well, they seem okay. So I want someone who is really looking to, to improve and to learn and to grow. And finally, self-awareness. And this is the crucial one. This is the one that sort of underscores and informs and reinforces all the rest. Because people who are self-aware understand how they come across to other people. They understand how to work as part of a team. They understand how to manage the changing dynamic, not just of the code, but of the people they're working with. When people change roles, when people join, when people leave, being able to deal with all these things, the root of this is self-awareness. So I encourage you to try to, when interviewing, figure out what signs are associated with self-awareness and then look for those. Because I think without self-awareness, we're, we're, really, we're really in trouble. Um, so finally, this last one on the slide. Peter Norvig, and there's a link to this, um, so when I, I'll tweet the speaker deck slides so you don't have to memorize a shortened URL. Um, Peter Norvig went and uh, found actually a negative correlation, not, not a non-correlation, but a negative correlation between people who are good at whiteboard interviews, traditional interviews, and job performance. And I don't think that means that people who are good at interviewing are necessarily bad at software engineering. But what I think it means is that interviewing is a separate skill from the jobs that we do. There are people who are very, very good engineers who are not good at traditional interviews. There are people who are very, very good at traditional interviews who are not very good engineers. So that brings us to our next hand-raising exercise. Uh, raise your hand if you now are or have ever kind of made the jump from individual contributor to manager, if you're familiar with that management. Okay, keep your hand in the air if you believe that the very best developers make the very best managers all the time. Yeah. Right, yeah. That's what I thought, my hand also went down. Um, so we understand intrinsically there is a difference in these skill sets, right? Being an excellent developer does not make you an excellent manager. It's a separate skill that can be learned. And interviewing is the same deal. Interviewing is a separate skill from software engineering that can be learned. So yes, you can go out and get really good at interviews and get tons and tons of offers, but I don't think that's the right answer. I think the right answer uh, is to fix interviewing. And I think, I think this kind of identification of the mistake we're making and actively taking steps to address it is part of that. So now I'm obligated to tell you that Hulu is hiring. Um, <laughs> so if you're interested in working at Hulu, come find me. Um, I put a card up on the job board. Um, I'm always happy to talk about what we're doing at Hulu, what my team is doing, things like that. My contact info will also be up on the final slide if you want to send me an email or tweet at me or, or come find me on GitHub <laughs> or something like that. So now we've looked at what interviewing can be like or what problems with interviews that there are that we can address. And we've looked a little bit at how you know, bootcamp graduates differ from those with more traditional backgrounds getting a sense of how we might modify our practices. I sort of want to turn now to how we can help folks grow and learn on the job. And, and I kind of also want to underscore again, this is, this is kind of a fib, this is kind of like a, a misleading talk title because this is about everyone, not just about bootcamp graduates. Although, like I said, it's a, it's a good lens for investigating this. If you take nothing else away from this talk, uh, I'd like you to take this away. This is the most important thing in the entire talk. The belief that you can improve, that you can grow. And moreover, that your culture is one of growing and learning and getting better. And it's super important, so I'm just gonna read it to you, even though I hate when people read things to me. Um, the belief that you can improve your abilities results in better performance than if you believe you either have it or you don't. So uh, Carol Dweck, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, uh, wrote a paper a bit ago, uh, Is Math a Gift? Beliefs That Put Females at Risk. Uh, and then later a book she also uh, wrote called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, which investigates this kind of dichotomy, right? Are we born with it? Are we talented? Are we innately good? Or is this something that we learn through practice? And it turns out when you prime someone on a task with the belief that they can get better through practice, they will actually do better than if you prime them with like a don't worry about it, some people are good at math, some people aren't, here's a math test. They will do worse than the people who you say, listen, no pressure, this is a thing you can get better at through practice and dedication, and it's a learned skill. So like I said, if you take nothing else away from this talk, please take this away, that the belief that you can grow and making sure your culture is one of growing and getting better is, is what underpins the whole, the whole thing. 
So there's a bit of a talk within a talk here. <laughs> this kind of talkception type thing. Um, so uh, more exercises. Uh, how many of you, this is your very first RailsConf? Oh wow, that's awesome, cool. There's always new people every year. I'm, I'm always super excited, so welcome. This is really cool that you're here. Um, if you were at RailsConf two years ago, uh, Chuck Lauervos did a talk called Building Kick-Ass Internal Education Programs for Large and Small Budgets. And so if you saw that, that's awesome. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. Um, the links to the slides and to the YouTube video are here on the slide. Um, but if you didn't see it, you don't have to wait. <laughs> I'm gonna kind of TLDR it for you because I think all of his ideas are awesome and, and are part of growing people who you've now welcomed into your organization. So here's the plan, real quick. One, you don't have to know everything, which is good. Second, start Monday. This is something that you can do immediately. This is not something you have to wait for. This is not something, hopefully, that you need uh, tons of approval to do. Uh, two examples of things that we can do are lightning talks. There are lightning talks here at RailsConf. There are lightning talks at meetups. You can bring them to your organization. They can be about anything. You can also do kind of more in-depth workshops, lunch and learns, kind of a weekly, maybe half hour type thing, and talk about X, Y, Z. We'll, we'll cover a couple topics that I've found uh, in my career have been valuable. And finally, the idea of the accountability buddy. This is, uh, this is good for a lot of things, and we'll touch on all of them, but essentially pairing new hires with people who are more experienced in the organization to help with onboarding and things like that. So we'll go through these uh, in a little bit more detail, and hopefully my speaking speed is still good. I'm getting really amped up. This is like my fourth cup of coffee too, so. Um, I haven't seen any, any waving or flailing, so that's good. I'm, I'm not going too, too fast. So one, like I said, uh, you, you don't have to know everything. The good news is you literally can't. I know I, I just told you that I should be priming you on things that you can learn and get better at, um, but unfortunately you cannot get better at knowing everything. It is impossible, so don't worry about it. Second, teaching someone how to do something is an excellent way to learn it yourself. So if you teach someone something, you're not only spreading knowledge throughout your organization, you're getting better at it, you encourage someone else to teach things, they get better at it, and it's sort of a domino effect of, of goodness, which is nice. And this kind of little Zen bit at the end is just, you know, my reassuring you that you don't have to know where you're going, you can start this on Monday and not have an end in mind. Uh, that is totally fine. As long as you keep working on it, it will grow organically. So please do start on Monday when you, when you go to work. It's Monday, May 9th, 2016, um, this coming Monday. Uh, you should feel empowered to do this. This is something that you shouldn't really need your boss's 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 signature in order to go and, and go do. So I encourage you to sort of take this into your own hands and, and start this education program yourself. And like I said, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to know where it's going. Uh, you just have to have a couple seeds. Um, and you know, like, like I said, we've, uh, a few slides ago, we solved interviewing forever, which is awesome. So now that interviewing is solved, hopefully the folks in your organization are interested in growing, interested in learning. They should be pushing already to do something like this. Like you should have something kind of like bubbling under the surface if you don't already have an internal education program. So hopefully momentum uh, will be easy to achieve. Like I said, lightning talks are an excellent way to start this. You can say on Monday, hey, we're doing lightning talks on Friday, uh, 4 p.m., and prepare something, right? That's a good first step. They can be technical, they can be non-technical, they can be in-house, you can do them at meetups, you can practice your next RailsConf talk as a lightning talk, uh, the sky's the limit. And remember that teaching something is a great way to learn it. Um, lightning talks are, like I said, a part of RailsConf. You should totally sign up to do one. Um, I don't know when and where signups are. I do know that the lightning talks this year are uh, Thursday from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, I think that it's in the RailsConf documentation and all the, all the excellent stuff that we've gotten from the RailsConf organizers. So I encourage you to sign up for one, or at the very least, go see one so you can get a sense of what lightning talks are like and, and what you might be able to bring to your organization. Again, I, I apologize for throwing a bunch of links at you. These will be much more valuable when the slides are online, which will be later today. These are just some gists that I've cooked up over the last couple of years to, to sort of come up with curricula, right, for in-house programs. Um, so the ones that have been really valuable are Git, and, and these tend to be more valuable for actually folks who do have computing science backgrounds who have not necessarily worked with lots of other developers on huge projects. So learning Git, right, uh, learning how to rebase and squash commits, learning how to use Git bisect, which is huge. Uh, so there's a, a gist, uh, a link here that kind of just goes through like 10-ish weeks of Git and you know, half-hour training. Uh, ECMAScript 6 or 2015 or 2016 or, or JavaScript Next or Harmony or whatever it is we call it. Um, there are a lot of people who are super interested in this and just like you're working on an older code base, you don't have the opportunity to switch it up. 
again, this is something that even folks with a traditional background might be interested in because you probably don't get a chance to do a lot of JavaScript in undergrad, which is probably good. Um, and these last two, I think, are, are valuable for folks who have backgrounds that are non-traditional. Uh, these are functional programming. Uh, this is through the lens of JavaScript, but can be functional programming in Ruby or Python or what have you. And the last one is uh, data structures and algorithms for web development. So when you do have a tree problem, when you do have a graph problem, you can go through these exercises and you can use these hopefully as a, a basis for your own education programs. And again, these are gists. They've been edited, revised. They're constantly growing and changing. And I think you know being open to that change is huge. So if you say, hey, Fridays at lunch, we're doing lunch and learns. Here's the topic, or here's, here's some topics. Like we should kind of vote on what we want to do. We should go in this order. We should talk about this thing. Again, they're going to kind of evolve and grow organically. So I encourage you just to get, just kind of plant the seed, plant the tree, and, and let it grow. Finally, uh, accountability buddies. <laughs> this is the obligatory South Park reference, which is a Hulu show. Uh, if you don't subscribe to Hulu, you can subscribe to Hulu and you can watch South Park. <laughs> my, <laughs> my boss did not tell me to do that. Um, so the idea is to pair new people with a mentor from the organization for, say, the first three months. And I think Chuck in his talk said, onboarding time went down drastically by doing this. It was something like, it took six months to spin somebody up before they instituted the program, uh, and now it takes three. So you can expect, and anecdotally, I've had similar results. So you can expect a, like a, a very noticeable reduction in onboarding time simply by having a mentor for someone to go to and say, hey, how do we deploy this thing? What does this service do? How do I make coffee? Like all these things that you want to know very early on in your time at a new company that say HR is not going to be able to help you with. It's not benefits related. It's not things like that. It's, it's kind of the day in and day out of, of developing software or, or staying alive in the case of coffee. Uh, and like I said, uh, this is a thing you can do immediately. So I think this is the last, last hand raise I'm going to inflict on you. Raise your hand if you feel prepared to do this on Monday, May 9th, 2016. Even just to like send out an email or a hip chat or a Slack thing and be like, hey guys, what do you think of this? I feel like I don't see enough hands up. We'll talk after if you feel unprepared. <laughs> we will get you prepared. You'll be good. And that's the end of the audience participation, so you guys can relax now. I'm not going to call on you. Um, OK, so if you've gotten this far, thank you. Um, this is the, the TLDPA, the, the too long, didn't pay attention. Um, and this is sort of the whole talk in three bullet points. So um, essentially, it's this. I would encourage you to write down what you're looking for when you're interviewing someone. I mean, actually like write it down. Say, here are the skills that we're looking for. Here are the personality traits. Here's what we want people to know how to do. Here's who we like. Here's what we need. And compare that against what you're interviewing for. And if you're not getting at those things with your interviews, it shouldn't be surprising to you that you're not finding the right folks. Um, and, and hopefully this is kind of like, oh man, all right eye-opening type thing. This is not meant to make anyone feel bad about interviewing. Like we said, you know, there's a reason there's like an interviewing is broken blog post like every week. Um, and hopefully this is a, a nice way to fix it. And like I said, or, or help fix it. But you know, oftentimes what you're not, you're not looking for someone who is a computing scientist. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you have very academic problems or problems that have a very traditional root. And that's great. You should, if you need someone who can write a red black tree and balance it from memory or AVL trees or splay trees or other data structures that I only know the names of, that's fine. You should, you should hire those people. But oftentimes that's not what we need and we should be aware of that. I think also that we need to look for strengths, identify what makes someone shine, what makes someone valuable, rather than probing for weaknesses. Because we're always gonna be disappointed if we probe for weaknesses, right? Like we're gonna be disappointed if we find one we're going to be sort of mad if we don't. Like, all right, well, whatever. Like, I guess this person is way better than me. That's fine. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, but essentially, we want to know what someone can bring to the table and, and not focus on where their weaknesses lie. Second, like I said, this is the whole theme of the talk. I encourage you to take this away, if nothing else. Believe in improvement. Believe that you can be better. Believe that improvement is, is part of what we do all the time and, and work to make that part of the culture. And, and finally, sort of be the change you want to see in the company. Uh, I'm reasonably sure I stole this from Gandhi in some capacity. Um, but, you know, it's not just the code base. It's not just like the kind of the, the you know, uh, the Boy Scout rule of, you know, leave things better than you found them. Uh, really, you need to apply this to your culture to identify what it is that you need and want, how to get better, um, and to iterate on your culture the same way that you iterate on your code. Because fundamentally, all tech problems are people problems, right? At, at some point in the chain of events, some human was typing stuff into a keyboard. So I encourage you to keep that in mind, that every single problem that we have, technically, is also uh, at its heart uh, a people.
simple problem. And that's nice because while machines are little deterministic or non-deterministic boxes of feelings that do what they want, humans are also kind of like that but are, are easier to understand, I think. Anyway, so thanks again for coming to my talk. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, like I said, if you have questions, um, we'll take time for questions. If for some reason we don't have time, please do feel free to come up to me and, and, and look for me uh, all throughout the rest of RailsConf. I'll be here. Um, like I said, all my contact info is up here on this slide. Um, so feel free to reach out. Uh, if you do want a copy of Ruby Wizardry or you have questions about it, please let me know or feel free to take advantage of the discount code. And thanks so much. Sure, so the question is, for bootcamp graduates, they often have portfolios of work. Do we read their code? Um, you, you might have seen if you read Hacker News, which I try not to, uh, or at least not the comments. Uh, there was a blog post recently that was like, you know, forget you, I'm not gonna spend two hours reading your code, I'm not gonna spend two hours reading your stuff, I'm not gonna look at your website. I strongly disagree with that. Um, I do a lot of interviewing, I'm super busy all the time. I, I make time to look at portfolios, I make time to read stuff on GitHub. I'm not gonna read everything, I might just kind of go straight, if you have a Rails application, go straight for your controllers and see what's going on, because um, there's a lot of doom there. Um, I, <laughs> I might go and, and take a look at a project you've done, I might pop the console and kind of dig around in the JavaScript and say, oh, this person's using React, that's really cool. I might go and look and see how you're thinking about structuring JavaScript applications or how your Ruby application is built or if it's a language I've never seen before, try to learn something new. But yeah, the short answer is I, I do, if there's a portfolio or a GitHub profile or something like that, I do try to read that because I think it's super valuable. Sure, so the question is, we get a ton of applications, at least in terms of boot camps, for every single position that is appropriate for someone who's graduated from a boot camp uh, in terms of background and skills. Um, how do we do a first pass? How do I cut that down to a reasonable, manageable number? Um, so some things that I do, and these are sort of ad hoc anecdotal. Um, I read resumes pretty carefully. Um, I, I know that this is gonna be frowned upon by some folks, but like, I look to see if someone you know, has updated their resume that it's the most up to date. I will take a look and say, hey, are these things spelled right? Um, are these technologies that we use, are these things that we're interested in? Um, I'm, I'm kind of a weird stickler for that stuff, but I firmly believe that you know, in the age of spell check and the age of like, being able to ping someone in your organization and say, hey, like, can you look at this, or I guess not your organization, because then they would know that you were interviewing. Um, but your friends and be like, hey, can you look at my resume? Can you look at my application for this job? Um, I firmly believe that people who are really spending a fair amount of time or who are interested in an organization will go ahead and do that. Um, essentially signs that someone's kind of shotgunning, right? And that's easy to do. And it's, it's really stressful when you're coming out of a program like a boot camp and you kind of want to maximize your chances for success. It, it feels like it is kind of a, a heavy ask to be like, well, do you super want to work at Hulu or do you just want to sort of work somewhere, right? Um, but again, like I said, the culture stuff, the, the desire to learn, the desire to grow, the desire to do meaningful work, um, I think is sort of tied into people picking and choosing the places that they want to interview. And so I, I kind of look for signs that this person has looked uh, at my organization in particular on purpose. So oftentimes, like things that don't come with a, a cover letter, I'm kind of bummed. Like I like to read cover letters. I like people to explain why they want to work on a particular problem or a particular team. Um, so that tends to actually screen about half of people. Half of people have something about it, and I, I apologize for being a, a human who is swayed by things like typos, um, but has like, you know, it basically narrows it down to people who seem interested. Um, and I'm actually super uh, interested if you guys have ways of doing this or, or things I can do better. Because like I said, this is an iterative process, so I'd love to get better at interviewing. If you guys have tips, please, please do come find me. Sure, so the question is, is there anyone at Hulu, or I suppose anywhere really, uh, who's not swayed by this, who kind of thinks interviewing is not broken, that it's fine the way it is, and, and what would be my advice to folks coming out of boot camps to win these people over? Yeah, the answer is for any sufficiently large organization, you're gonna find this. Uh, I do know people uh, everywhere who firmly believe that if you can't do a graph traversal problem on a whiteboard, you don't deserve to work as a software engineer that there's no space for people who don't have that background, that somehow they're missing something so fundamental that the only solution is to go learn that thing and come back. And that is one option. There are books like Cracking the Coding Interview. There are a, a number of websites that kind of teach you dynamic programming problems. They teach you graph traversal, tree traversal, things like that. So you can you know, meaningfully tackle 80% you know, of whiteboard interviews and do fine. That is one option. Um, I found in my career that it is impossible to reason people out of positions they didn't reason themselves into. So if someone has reasoned themselves into the, the belief that uh, you need to know these things, I think logic does seem to work pretty well. So I'll sit and, you know, we do debriefs, we do little round tables after interviews, and someone will say, well, you know, this person, we're interviewing them for a front-end job, or interviewing them for like a, to work on a, a legacy Rails application, and they do have like 10 years of experience doing Rails stuff, but I asked them a dynamic programming question and they couldn't really do it. 
and they'll say, okay, well, what dynamic programming problems have we done recently, right? What is the, what is the impetus for this idea that what you're interviewing for is valuable for the thing that we need? Um, that's sort of how I win them over. I think as a bootcamp graduate, the best you can do is, is kind of say, hey, listen, like, um, this is a thing that I think is interesting. Here's the best solution I've got. Does it seem reasonable in an interview? And I, it's hard to not want to just like throw the marker, give up, and be like, listen, I can't do this. Um, it does seem reasonable to say, can we work on this together? That works maybe half the time. Sometimes the interviewer just thinks of that as like a, a ask for a pass, and that's no good. Um, but I think most interviewers, if you say, hey, here's what I think seems reasonable, you just give it the ugliest, brute, forciest, naivest solution you can, say, does this seem to work? And then most interviewers will say, yeah, that does work or that doesn't work, or did you think about this? And then they're willing to sort of work with you on it. Um, short term, unfortunately, the best answer might be learn how to do these things. While, while, while people, hopefully, like us, like me, like you, kind of go and, and try to promulgate this, this new theory of, or maybe not new, this, this hopefully better theory of interviewing. Um, it will take time, but I'm, I'm optimistic. Sure. So the question is, can I expand a little bit on what I mean by self-awareness and down the line, sort of what does that look like? Does that sound? Cool. Um, so when I say self-aware, what I mean is uh, the person is nice, right? This is someone you enjoy talking to. This is someone who will not talk over you, right? Some examples, someone, I, I will sometimes purposely say something that's sort of a generality. It's, an, it's, it's not quite right, it's close. Uh, and I listen to see if that person will say, well, actually, I guarantee you, like 99.99% .99 of sentences that start with, well, actually, you just should stop listening to the rest of that sentence because it's <laughs> not useful for your life. Um, I will spend some time saying, okay, well, you know, I try to avoid like the very transparent, like, tell me about a time you had a disagreement with a coworker, right? Um, but say, hey, so that sounds really cool. Um, that doesn't sound like, that seems like an unorthodox way to do that. What did your team think of that? Uh, or what did your boss think of that? Or, hey, it's really cool that you're using Elixir at work. How hard was it to kind of get buy-in? Like, how did you do that? and get, look for clues like, did that person sort of stampede people? Did that person kind of put it out there and everyone kind of said no and they sort of did it anyway, right? Like we've, we've all seen people who kind of go off and, and sort of do their own thing. Um, getting a sense of, does the person seem empathetic to the problems that you have in your organization when you describe it? Or do they kind of say, oh, I know how to solve that. Or, eh, that's a dumb problem. I don't really care about that problem, right? <laughs> um, sort of, do they seem aware of how they come across? Like, do they seem aware if the interview is going well or poorly? Um, things like that. Um, in terms of how that sort of evolves over time, I found that people who are more self-aware in organizations tend to do much, much better. And again, because working at an organization, you're working as part of a team, you have to be aware of how you come across. There have been some exceptions where I know people who are not super self-aware, but they've managed to find like a manager who's like, who is, and they're like, oh, don't worry about so-and-so, like here's, when they said that thing, here's what they meant. Or here's, here's actually, like I, I know that came across kind of harsh, but here's actually, and that can sometimes work if you've got someone who's super, super talented but has trouble. Um, but I found most people um, will do their best to, uh, if it's kind of quietly brought to their attention by a peer or, or a superior, they'll, they'll try really hard to, to be better. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. Right, right. So the question is, uh, is there something above and beyond sort of as you're growing people beyond these kind of like periodic touch points to ensure that your employees are growing, that the organization is, and essentially the communication is still working, is what it sounds like. Um, so certainly having those, those periodic touch points are valuable and I think necessary. So you do want to have one-on-ones with your team members. You do want to make sure that there are larger team meetings less frequently that sort of are used as two directional conduits and I think that's probably part of it. So above and beyond having these touch points, I think it's important for meetings between like management and your team or however your organization is broken down are two-way, right? So it's not just the organization, you know, the, the biz leads coming to you and saying, hey, here's, uh, give me a status update, right? Um, and, and sort of them knowing what, what engineering is doing secretly when they're not watching. Um, it's, I think, more about having a two-way communication. Like when I do one-on-ones, I make sure that I say, you know, is there anything you need from me? Am I blocking you? Is there anything that you want to talk about? Stuff like that. But I'll also say, hey, here are some things that I know are happening soon, um, and you might need them for context on why we're prioritizing a particular project. You might need it to sort of understand why we're being asked to do what we're doing. And I think that's valuable, right? Because no one really likes to work in a vacuum. So making sure that communication is two-way, I think, is super valuable. Uh, another thing is to, like I said, make sure that this, this notion of growing and getting better is a, is a truly cultural thing, right? Culture is always, always, always set at the top of your organization. So if at the very top, there's no buy-in for an internship program, or there's no buy-in for con continuing development, if there's no buy-in for, for programs like that, it's going, to be, it's going to be hard. And like I said, this is something you should feel empowered to do on your own, and I think you can, you can grow it up to the top. 
but if you meet active resistance, right? Like we're not spending money on that, we're not spending time on that, you guys should be pushing features and not learning things. Um, that's, that's a signal to, to go somewhere else possibly. Um, so I guess above and beyond those touch points, it's, those two things seem appropriate to me. Um, making sure that communication is always two way and making sure that you do everything you can to kind of pass upwards. So like when I have one on ones with my boss, I'll, uh, you know, he'll tell me about what's going on, but I'll also say, hey, like my team is super interested in this, can you, can you push this along? Um, and so you can have a large effect for just your team doing just you and things will go well. Um, but I've found that the multiplier is having the folks at the very top also on board. Cool, so we're, we're at time. I don't want to impinge on the next talk, so thanks so much, guys, and please do find me if you have more questions.